JP Audio for November 2021. I'm Aaron Van Dorn. Today on the podcast, I spoke with Dr. Jennifer Stevens, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Stevens is an author of a paper in the current issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry, which investigated a technique to classify trauma victims into discrete biotypes in the immediate aftermath of trauma, with the hope of providing insight into the groups that could be used to guide treatment. Afterwards, I spoke with Dr. Ned Kalin, editor-in-chief of the journal, about the November issue of AJP and other content in it. Dr. Stevens, can you tell us about your study? Yes. So we know that major life stressors can begin or worsen psychiatric symptoms, like symptoms of depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And most people are actually resilient. So they may have symptoms for a few weeks after a traumatic event, like a car accident or assault, but quickly adapt afterwards and return to their normal functioning. But some people have chronic symptoms that will affect them for long periods of time unless they receive treatment. So we wanted to know whether we can use brain imaging data to understand the different ways that people respond to trauma. And the idea was to identify groups so that we'll have more information about who could benefit from early post-trauma interventions and what types of interventions might benefit some people versus others. To test this, we enrolled people within 72 hours of a traumatic event in emergency departments across the U.S. We then followed them for the next year to understand what types of symptoms emerge and in whom they emerge. We looked across all different mental health outcomes with the understanding that PTSD or depression are not the only things that can become problematic for people. And this was the Aurora study, which we're just wrapping up this year, and it was a large multi-site study of more than 3,000 participants, followed from 29 different emergency departments. And the parent study was led by Sam McLean, Carrie Ressler, Kirsten Conan, and Ron Kessler. So we had a great multidisciplinary team working on this project. And in the study published in the journal, we used brain imaging data from task-based neuroimaging using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, collected two weeks after the initial traumatic event. We wanted to understand whether patterns of brain activity across multiple neurocognitive tasks might help us map the different types of responses or the heterogeneity that people experience in the early aftermath of the stress exposure. And to identify these groups, we used hierarchical clustering, which is a way of grouping together people who show similar profiles of fMRI activation. We used an unsupervised pattern analysis, which is a very data-driven approach We wanted to see what types of patterns bubble up if we don't impose many of our own thoughts about what might be important to the trauma response. And we called the clusters that we identified biotypes. Our field has been searching for a way to marry patients' clinical presentation and self-reported symptoms with data about their brain structure and function. And we think that the approach of biotyping might lend a lot to this conversation. So identifying groups based on brain imaging data separate from their self-reported symptoms. And you could think of this as being similar to the molecular subtyping of different types of tumors and cancer. You know that the person has cancer, but you need more information about the tumor cells to decide on the best treatment approaches. We hope that adding information about patients' neural profiles will one day improve clinical decision-making in psychiatry also. You mentioned that your study used an interesting combination of looking at neurological activity via MRI scans while participating in a computer-based activity two weeks after a traumatic event, in this case a car crash, as well as longer-term follow-up by self-reported surveys. How did you arrive at that structure and what were the limitations to it? We were very interested in the idea of prediction. A visit to the emergency department is a brief window where a lot of people are making contact with the healthcare system when they might otherwise not. So it provides an ideal window for intervention to improve people's mental health following trauma. And we wanted to know whether neuroimaging data early after trauma can tell us something about what types of symptoms people will experience in the future. So this defined our timing. Early post-trauma scans at two weeks, followed by sequential symptom assessments over the next year, covering a broad array of symptom types. And then as far as the neuroimaging approach, we selected different fMRI tasks that would probe aspects of neurocognitive function that have been transdiagnostically implicated in a number of different psychiatric disorders that have a stress-related component. We looked at threat reactivity using a fearful faces task and reward reactivity using a monetary reward task and response inhibition using a go-no-go task. We selected the simplest task paradigms that we could to help make the data more interpretable. And for each task, we looked at a very simple set of brain regions that are known to regulate threat, reward, and inhibition, including the amygdala and insula, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and nucleus accumbens. Our analyses considered each individual's full profile of activation across these key tasks and key brain regions because they've been implicated over and over a number of times in different psychiatric disorders. 
And we looked for groups of people who naturally showed similar types of profiles to one another across all of these tasks. I thought that we might see that low reward responsivity in the ventral striatum and low prefrontal engagement and inhibition and high threat reactivity in the amygdala would be one possible profile that might be considered risky predicting either depression or PTSD symptoms because previous studies, if they look at these different domains in isolation, they often see linear associations with symptoms of either PTSD or depression for each one of these things. As far as the limitations, at the beginning of the project, I knew that the approach might be too blunt to really help with risk prediction. Prediction is a really tricky problem that a lot of people have been trying to deal with in the clinical neuroimaging in psychiatry. And the way that we tackled the problem was, I mean, definitely blunt. So first of all, the, the treatment of the neuroimaging data was not computationally sophisticated. So we didn't use novel complex modeling of neural circuit function or multimodal data or any of the types of tools that are really gaining traction in the field right now. And those tools are really useful and cool, but we kind of kept it simple by design because we wanted the approach to be very transparent and potentially easy to translate. And so we're basically just looking at how people differ from one another in different domains of neurocognition. And that also means that we didn't group people with respect to their current or future psychiatric symptoms. So it's a very bottom-up and transdiagnostic approach that we took, which meant that the groups that came out might have had nothing to do with someone's risk for PTSD, major depression, or other chronic symptoms. So I was a little worried that we'd maybe end up with like a group of people who are older versus younger, or maybe people with severe injuries in the index trauma versus less severe injuries, but that's not actually what we saw. So the groupings didn't have anything to do with trauma severity or demographic characteristics or the place where people were scanned or even the quality of the fMRI data, but they did have predictive value for telling us about the later symptoms that would emerge over the six months following trauma. The study found distinct profiles or biotypes for participants in reaction to various cues, and some of the categories were reactive, disinhibited, low reward, high threat, and inhibited. Can you tell us about the profile categories and what makes them distinct? Yes. So the low reward, high threat group, as I mentioned before, this is the group that I thought would have been associated with psychiatric risk based on my initial hypotheses. So they showed high threat reactivity in the amygdala, insula, and dorsal anterior cingulate, sort of a circuit that regulates threat detection and response. And they showed low reward reactivity in the nucleus accumbens and amygdala, regions that are important for reward responses. They also showed heightened fear in our psychophysiological assessment of fear conditioning and extinction, which was really this heightened fear was observed in the beginning of conditioning and extinction, potentially indicating an anticipatory response. But what was interesting was that this group actually showed fairly good recovery of symptoms post-trauma. So this group was not linked with heightened risk across any of our outcomes, which included symptoms of PTSD, depression, impulsivity, anxiety, and dissociation. So this was a bit surprising to me. In contrast, the reactive disinhibited group was a group that showed a profile of high reactivity of the amygdala and insula to social threat stimuli and high reward responsivity in the nucleus accumbens, so high reactivity to both threat and reward. And they had low engagement of inhibitory regions in the response inhibition task. And then also, sort of similarly, when we looked outside of the regions that we had fed into the clustering analysis, we also saw greater threat-related activation of the hypothalamus and the cluster of activation near the pons overlapping the median raphe nucleus and the ventral segmental area, and these are regions involved in wake and arousal. So I, I think that what we were really seeing is a hyperarousal type of profile. And this was the risk group. So this group showed the greatest future symptoms of PTSD and the anxiety across all the time points out to six months post-trauma, which was very interesting indicating that maybe a stress-related potentiation of the reward response post-trauma could indicate psychiatric risk. And this is consistent with some earlier work in AJP published by Robin Nesslock and colleagues showing a similar pattern for reward reactivity in adults who experienced childhood maltreatment. And I, I really think as trauma researchers start to consider reward-related brain function more often, we might find that this sort of unexpected pattern might indicate risk for stress-related psychopathology in subsets of individuals. And then last, the inhibited group was the most resilient looking group. They showed the highest engagement of the MPFC and hippocampus in the response inhibition task, but their re responses to reward and threat were more blunted compared with other individuals in the study. 
And for most of the symptom types that we looked at, this group was recovering down close to their baseline pre-trauma levels by six months post-trauma. Beyond identifying these biotypes, what does this mean for treating trauma patients going forward? We hope that these profiles could provide potential targets for new clinical trials of early interventions that are designed to improve resilience and recovery after trauma. For example, maybe in the reactive group, early psychological interventions could include discussion of risk-taking behavior, which really hasn't had a major role in past study designs. And I think the pattern that we see in the neuroimaging data also points to an important potential role of dopaminergic circuits in a type of stress response that could lead to chronic symptoms. It's really notable that most of the early intervention trials based on our mechanistic understanding of the stress response have failed, which has been really disappointing. But I mean, part of it is the fact that it's just really difficult for a new intervention to beat out the natural recovery response post-trauma, because as I said, most people are resilient and, and recover naturally over the first few months. But I think our findings indicate that there's important variability in patterns of brain function that have relevance to post-trauma risk, and it might be that we need to deliver certain interventions to certain individuals, including maybe a two-week MRI scan in future trials of interventions delivered in the ED or on the battlefield could be one way to assess progress with the intermediate outcome in addition to tracking symptoms. What are the next steps for this research? At this point, I think the translational implications of the findings are not entirely clear, and that's mostly because we can only gain so much information from fMRI. In the Aurora study, we're also gathering blood biomarkers within a few hours of trauma exposure and then also longitudinally over that year following trauma. And I think the information that we can gather about protein expression changes and genetic mutations associated with symptom trajectories will give us much more clear targets for novel resilience-boosting interventions. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to combine the information that we have about the three fMRI-based biotypes from this study with future genomic analyses to see if there might be some clear targets for interventions that emerge. Dr. Stevens, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Up next, I spoke with Dr. Ned Kalin, Editor-in-Chief of the American Journal of Psychiatry, about what else is in the issue and how it all fits together. Dr. Kalin, the November issue of AJP looks at issues of trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide, and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Stevens spoke earlier about a new way of grouping trauma victims by biotype, but what can you tell us about how these topics and the contents of the November issue are linked? We're excited about the November issue because of the new research that's presented there, as well as a very interesting review that's in that paper. The theme, as as you already mentioned, is trauma and suicide. These are topics that are very linked as we think about trauma as a factor that underlies the risk for all psychiatric types of disorders, especially PTSD. And also trauma is linked to suicide itself through the disorders that it can be a factor with as well as uh, independently. So the theme is to really bring together then uh, some cutting edge work related to to trauma. Uh, The paper that you just talked about with Dr. Stevens is a very interesting paper where she and co-authors have a very novel approach to assessing brain function after trauma, and then using machine learning to really try to understand whether or not predictions can be made about who is going to be developing significant PTSD symptoms and illness and who is not. And their, their findings are early, but they suggest, in fact, that that is a doable uh, outcome, which is exciting from the standpoint of thinking about where we might go clinically in the future. What else is in the issue that is linked to this topic? So the other papers that are directly linked are related to, as I already mentioned, suicide. You know, the linkage is there from the standpoint of the trauma linkage to suicide. The linkage is also there from the standpoint of depression and trauma being related to depression and other psychiatric illnesses. One of the papers that's really quite interesting is looking at the genetic and environmental components of both suicide attempts and successful suicides. And one of the interesting findings from this paper, which is authored by Dr. Edwards and co-authors, is that it draws on a huge sample from Sweden, from the National Registry of over 1,300,000 people. And by using this large sample, one can do analyses related to heritability as well as the environmental contributions to suicide attempts and deaths. And one of the things that they found was that the genetic underpinnings or the heritability of suicide attempts and suicide deaths is actually shared, which means that it's likely that the same genes uh, may be underlying both attempts and deaths, which is not necessarily intuitive. 
uh, because suicide attempts are obviously very different than someone who completes a suicide or a suicide completion. What's also interesting in that paper is that roughly 40 to 50% of the heritability is related to suicide attempts and deaths, which suggests that another 50% is related to environmental factors. And there, when you look at whether or not the environmental factors are shared between suicide attempts and suicide deaths, the amount of sharing across the same types of environmental factors is much less than it is with, with genetics. So this is a way of beginning to parse out the genetic contributions to both suicide attempts and suicide deaths, as well as the environmental contributions. And also importantly, looks at how suicide attempts and suicide deaths are related from the standpoint of these heritable and environmental determining factors. There's a really nice editorial that accompanies this by Dr. John Mann from Columbia University, who's an expert in suicide, where he talks in general about the heritability of suicide and what we understand about some specific genes related to that. Another paper looks at soldiers or, or people in the service. And in this particular paper, the idea is to take a look at a large registry of US soldiers. These are soldiers where they had data from 2006 to 2009 almost a million soldiers, and to look at whether or not they could understand what would predict actual suicide attempts in soldiers that presented with suicidal ideation. So when we think about suicide, right, we have ideation, we have attempts, we have completion. And those are all related, but they're also different things. Uh, lots of people have suicidal ideation, less people have suicide attempts, and less people fortunately actually complete suicide. But how do these all relate to each other is one of the really important questions. And what, what these authors attempt to do is to try to take data from individuals in the Army that present for the first time with suicidal ideation, and then to follow them for a month period to see if they can understand what factors will actually predict their likelihood of acting on those ideas or thoughts. Basically, what they found was that, first of all, that the greatest risk in this population was related to being a male, a relatively young male, less than 30 years of age, being white, and also people or individuals that were earlier on in their service commitment were more likely to, to be in this group during the first two years of service. Another interesting finding was that Black individuals actually had less of a risk if they presented with suicidal ideation from the standpoint of that converting to a suicide attempt. And it's not clear why that's the case, but it, it's quite interesting. But we see this difference between black and white individuals, which I think really merits further understanding and further research. The other thing that was interesting was that they found that if you also had an anxiety problem or a sleep problem, when you presented with suicidal ideation, your likelihood of engaging in suicidal behavior during the first 30 days was heightened and was significant. Taken together, these papers first talk about sort of a major risk factor for all psychopathology that is trauma and trying to use modern imaging methods actually after a trauma occurs to make predictions about who's going to develop psychiatric problems. In this particular case that we talked about, it, it's PTSD. And the preliminary data suggests that this could be a, a very positive and fruitful approach in the future. And as we know, as I was saying before, that trauma is very much related to not only all psychopathology, but also to suicidal ideation and attempts. Then understanding from some of our other papers, what are the genetic and environmental factors and how do they relate to each other in relation to suicide attempts and actually completions of suicide. And then in the you know, US soldiers, using that population to understand how the presentation of suicidal ideation actually may result in a suicide attempt and what the factors are that increase the likelihood of that occurring. In addition to those papers, this issue also has a really very interesting review by Dr. Dylan G from Yale University, which also is related to trauma and is focused on the early development of children and how different events relate to the likelihood of developing resilience or being susceptible to develop psychiatric problems. And so that's a review that gets into more depth about the early life origins of childhood adversity and trauma can affect individuals 
to make them either more vulnerable or more resilient. And it nicely fits in with the PTSD study that we just talked about, which is looking at individuals later in life as they become traumatized later in life. Now, one of the interesting connections is that if you have early life trauma and later life trauma, you're even at greater risk to have problems. And that was actually one of the findings that was in the paper that we just talked about. The other interesting review, which is not related to this topic, but I think would be of great interest to our readers, is a review on Alzheimer's disease, an update from the standpoint of its biology, and also an update from the standpoint of how we can think about using biomarkers to better predict outcomes and also to guide the development of new treatments. And you know, when we think about biomarkers, what we're talking about are using physiological indicators that will be predictive of whether or not someone will develop an illness or perhaps the type of treatment that one should use for the illness or the likelihood of someone responding if they have an illness to a specific treatment. So what we're looking for throughout psychiatry are biological markers, could be imaging, it could be EEG, it could be a variety of other types of things that would be predictive in a reliable and specific way so that we could make better predictions about individual outcomes in patients as we treat them. And so what this paper does is try to, it really surveys the literature from the standpoint of what we understand about biomarkers in relation to Alzheimer's disease. And of course, if we could effectively predict Alzheimer's disease way before its onset, it could open up the whole idea of treating early on prior to the onset of very severe symptoms. There's been a tremendous amount of work in this area, uh, as I think uh, our readership knows. The two major biomarkers are related to amyloid and tau proteins. This is related to plaques and tangles in the brain that uh, are histopathological features of the disease. And one of the things that the authors point out is that we have some really good imaging methods now where we can actually image amyloid and tau. In many studies, uh, we can identify individuals at risk early in life. So this is really moving us along the path of early identification prior to the onset of symptoms even that are significant. But the authors also point out that while these are biomarkers that we can identify risk early in life, they are not necessarily related to the development of new treatments. Many folks, including Big Pharma, have attempted to develop drugs that will decrease the likelihood of amyloid accumulating in the brain with the idea that amyloid deposition results in neurotoxicity, which in and of itself results in cell death, which then leads to the cognitive and other emotion-related alterations that are severe in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So the treatment strategy has been to try to come up with medications that will actually reduce the accumulation of amyloid in the brain. And while a number of studies have demonstrated that there are molecules that people can take as drugs that will do that, unfortunately, that has not been reflected in positive clinical effects. So this is an interesting example of how we know something about what goes wrong in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we know some of the proteins that are involved. We can use those proteins as biomarkers to predict much earlier on in the illness, even before major symptom onset, the likelihood of individuals developing that illness. But even though we can do that, that, those particular molecules, at least right now, do not look like they're going to be effective treatment targets. So I think that in sum, the issue really is pretty broad. Again, it's focused on the related topics of PTSD and suicide, but also incorporates early adversity as a risk factor and speaks directly to what we currently understand about Alzheimer's disease in relation to biomarkers and the development of new treatments. Dr. Kalin, thank you for helping to put this issue into context for us. It's my pleasure, and I look forward to doing this as we bring out other issues. So thank you for the opportunity. That's all for this month, but I hope you consider joining us next time. But remember, APA Publishing has other podcasts you could listen to. Psychiatry Unbound is the books podcast from APA Publishing, hosted by Dr. Laura Roberts, Editor-in-Chief of APA Books. Also check out From Pages to Practice, which reviews the latest research published in the journal Psychiatric Services, hosted by Dr. Lisa Dixon, Editor-in-Chief of the journal, along with Dr. Josh Berzin. Check out these and others along with APA's newest podcasts, Mentally Healthy Nation, at psychiatryonline.org slash podcasts, or you can subscribe via Google, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts.
The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual speakers only and do not necessarily represent the views of the American Psychiatric Association. The content of this podcast is provided for general information purposes only and does not offer medical or any other type of professional advice. If you're having a medical emergency, please contact your local emergency response number.